Everybody have a good day this afternoon? Everybody have a good nap? I had an unintentional one, but I didn't complain about it. Um, Ephesians, if you would please, Ephesians. Amen. We are, um, we're done talking about the fourth dimension. <clears throat> and I'm going to put that in context. Um, first of all, some other things that I think are related to it. Uh, this fourth dimension that Paul speaks of here in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, in verse 18, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And, of course, the Bible identifies that fourth spatial dimension as height. Is not God in the height of heaven? Behold, the height of the stars, how high they are, is what Job says. So we have witnesses all in the Bible. Uh, number one, that are saying the same thing. Number two, they're, they're opening up something for us to understand as much as we're able to understand it. And understanding this is sort of like trying to understand um, eternity. Because we live in a non-eternal life. Um, everything that we are aware of and everything that we know and all that we know uh, <clears throat> begins and ends, just like time. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That was the beginning of time in Genesis 1-1. So God created time on the first day of creation. Even the word day is about time. And... Um, so it, it's teaching you this, this place that is beyond our boundaries and it is beyond time. Those who live in it are immortal to our understanding. They are immortal. They, uh, they do not die except for those who at the last judgment will be cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible's telling us that that is an eternal death. Now, here's the, here's the thing about it. It's a conscious death. You are aware of your surroundings. You are aware of the pain, the torture uh, that you're in. Like the rich man being in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. And that is the lake of fire. It um, heard Brother Reg... Kelly talk of it one time when he's teaching on the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he says, that's teaching us that when we come to God, we come to him bankrupt because we have written checks with our flesh that we can't cash. We're in debt and we have a sentence of death upon us, not just death in the body, but death in the soul as well. The soul is what survives the death of this body. And so for the soul then to go to a place that the Bible describes, number one, is everlasting, so it never ends. Number two, it's not annihilation uh, in the sense that everybody's soul is dissolved and becomes nothing the way uh, I'm sure some preachers preach. I know the Jehovah's Witness teach that. I know the Mormons teach that and other cults. Um, they believe you're just snuffed out gone like a vapor and uh, but that's not true because Jesus taught us in Matthew uh, 25 with the uh, parable of the sheep and the goats the sheep are put in everlasting um, blessedness and the goats to everlasting punishment it's not punishment if you're just snuffed out if you don't exist um, I got into a discussion about this with uh, Brady Crumb one time when he was a Jehovah's Witness. And he was trying to, he was trying to posture himself against me and um, lay claim that hell is the grave and once you die, you're gone. There's nothing to it. And I said, so what is the point then of even following any religion, much less Jehovah's Witness? And he said, well, you miss out on the blessedness. I said, what blessedness? You've already told me that you never will become one of the 144,000. So you are not going to heaven. But you believe that you're going to live forever on a, 
on earth like this. And I said, what's the joy of it? What's, tell, me, tell me what I'm missing here. Tell me what it is that I'm missing that I can't fulfill in my flesh. And if you tell me that hell only is just a annihilation of my whole being and my whole existence, then tell me what's the punishment for my sins. I can get away with anything I want to and you haven't sold me on your religion because you haven't told me what I should fear and you haven't told me what I hope to gain. And um, that, that didn't go very far with him at the time. But later he came around and I, I'm glad for that. Um, but anyway, uh, when you have teachings such as uh, the new heaven and new, new earth and the Bible describing uh, New Jerusalem as a city built four square. The Bible is giving you more of that information. It is telling you that this, this new city is going to be new and it's going to be everlasting new. You get a new car smell with New Jerusalem forever. You don't have to spray anything or put anything in your vents. Um, it's going to last forever. Behold, I make, and I like what Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. Isn't that neat? And um, no more old stuff, nothing like that. Uh, but it also then, it, it fits with, um, later on in Ephesians, the principalities, the powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness, which then leads us back to Daniel chapter 2, and the fourth kingdom um, really, really has to be a, a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. That iron kingdom is spiritual. It's the only thing that will work against humans. Men have tried to rule the world before. And they only get so far and it only lasts so long. And when the ruler's dead, the kingdom goes. When, when Hitler, Hitler gave up. He gave up. He went down in his bunker in Berlin. And to him, he took the hero's way out. Do what? Oh, oh okay. You, I thought you were pointing at me and something was, okay. Anyway, he, he believes he took the hero's way out. But he took the coward's way out. He was not going to be put on trial for any of the things he'd done. And so he left it up to Goering, who didn't commit suicide. Goering was hoping to take over and rule Germany as chancellor. But, uh, and all the top brass of the Nazi party, he left it up to them to deal with the allies and he took the coward's way out. Um, but Hitler tried to rule. He conquered most of Europe and he was moving into Russia. But he fell apart, his thousand year Reich fell apart and it's based upon men and that doesn't work. Spirits, however, can rule for a very, very long time. And uh, that's what I think is going to happen. And I think they are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. Um, I don't know what form that's going to take. I don't know how that's going to happen. But that's what I believe. Now, um, in Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> let's, let's go from verse 16 uh, to the end of the chapter, verse 21, and there's, there's something else I want to touch on here. In fact, a couple things here left over in chapter 3. Uh, starting in verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. And, you know, just if you want to underline that, that section there, the riches of his glory. The wealth that we seek in true Christianity is not monetary gain. It's not. Now, if God blesses you with that, then so be it. Some people make a good living. Some people make an, a modest living. Uh, some people are poor. Um, and whatever state that you're in, um, it may be that God may grant you a, a, a little bit better life than what you have. Um, but it's, it's not what we seek out. The love of money is the root of all evil. And so we need to, we need to stay away from that. But the riches of his glory that Christ will take us one of these days with him into heaven and we will see his glory. We will see him appearing in the clouds of heaven. And I believe we will shout and shout and shout and shout. And I'm looking forward to it. So we will, God is going to grant to us. Um, when I was, 
applying for college, um, I learned the difference between a college grant and a college loan. Yeah, Lisa still brings that up every now and then. She didn't know I had an outstanding loan from college. And all of a sudden we got a bill. Uh oh. But anyway, a grant was given to me that I didn't have to pay back. It was a free gift and the government provided it. The school had some smaller grants that I was, because I was a ministerial student. But the bottom line is, when God grants you something, it's not a debt. You don't owe him anything. And he's granting you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit. And here it is, in the inner man. Now, uh, let's pray before we go on. Father, we ask your blessings uh, on your word tonight. I thank you, Lord, that, that there, there is so much rich things, so many precious, rich things in your word. And Lord, words just cannot describe the beauty and the, the, the riches, the glory um, that you have and the glory that you share with your Father. And that glory you will share with us one day. And we can't even, can't even conceive of that, God, but we look forward to it. And we believe in it. And while our outer man uh, may not feel great, may not do so good on certain days, our inner man is always strengthened. Lord, teach us the difference. Teach us the difference tonight. Show us the way that you would have us to go. Bless your word in Jesus' name. And amen. So he brings up here um, in verse 16 again, uh, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type that phrase in. And we got one verse, Okay. Inner man, which is Ephesians 3.16. I like verses that are 3.16. It just seems like they are good verses. I don't know why. But anyway. Uh, how about the word inwardly? Um, when we look in the New Testament for words that are inwardly, we have Matthew 7.15, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, there's something different, isn't there? They're wolves. They're ravening wolves. But they, it's like what I was preaching this morning. They're whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. They look good on the outside and people tend to accept that. But they're not good and they have an, an evil intent in their life and it's inward. And that's what has to be changed. That is what has to be changed. I mean, stop and think about it. Right now we're living in a culture that is geared toward um, the alteration of the human body. Eventually it, it will be on the DNA level. For right now it's basically with piercings and odd colors of hair and then all of the tattoos that people get. So let's say we got somebody, they're, they're in their 40s, um, they've, they've got wacky hair, they've got stuff stuck in their ears, their nose and everything else and then they've got tattoos all over the place, all over their body and so on and so on. Can God still save them? Even though he said, don't do that. Don't, have, don't print marks on your skin. Don't do it. Can he still save them? Yes, because God is not saving the flesh. He's condemned. By your salvation, you just condemned it to die. Take it, God. Get it out. Get it away from me. But then there is an inward man that God will change. He will redeem it. He will alter it himself. We don't have to. We have the desire for it to happen, God does it for us through his word, through the, the, the actions that God takes upon us in our daily life. Those things will change us. We get, we get changed over time. We, we get more wise. We get a little bit more cautious about things and so on. And um, I, I used to be one that just would leap before I look. And sometimes I would speak before I thought. Uh, but the older I get, I'm more cautious now about leaping anywhere, jumping any, on anything. I want to make sure I got something to hang on to when I land. But um, that's God changing me over time. And he's the one that does it. And so when he says here, with might by his spirit in the inner man, uh, that's what he's talking about. That new man uh, here in Luke 11, same thing. There, your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Romans 2.29, a true Jew 
is one inwardly. And the word Jew comes from what word? Well, it's based on the tribe. What tribe? Judah. Now you got the, the white supremacists and the skinheads who say that the people who refer to themselves as Jews are not real Jews. So only us white Caucasian people. That's a bunch of garbage. I don't even spend much time with it anymore. But that's what they teach and that's what they believe. And they want to get into some argument with me. They, they know two verses out of the Bible. And they want to tell us that, the Bible, that we believe wrong because we believe that people who identify as Jews are really Jews. People by the name of Rubenstein is Jewish. Levin, they're Jewish. Cohen, they're Jewish. Ephraim, Solomon, they're Jewish people. All right. They're named after their forefathers. But anyway, they want to argue that point and say the only Jew are the people from Judah. But that's not what he says anywhere in the Bible. It is based on the word Judah. But think about that. We have Reuben. Simeon, who was born third, Levi, who was born Judah. So Christ is not a priest from Levi, which pertains to this world. He's a priest from Judah, which pertains to that world. I like that. And so he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but God and again that they they dealt with that issue in in the book of Acts chapter 15 when they had the Jerusalem council it was over number one should the Gentiles be circumcised number two should they keep all the law James is is the one who stood up and said why are we making them do it we didn't do it so they basically said what Paul said circumcision profit of nothing circumcision of the flesh profit of nothing for if a man's circumcised and yet he offends the law on another point, he's still guilty of the law. What good does this circumcision do? And Jews just, they miss that completely. Uh, Paul said in Romans 7, which I was going to go to with this, because Romans 7 is that, if you, if you want to take a note on this and go to Romans 7 and write this down, it is the quintessential teaching on the dual nature of man. You'll see it plain as day. And when you understand the characters, like the woman is bound to the law and all the while her husband liveth, she is bound to him until he dies. And if she leaves her husband and goes and marry another, then according to the law, she's an adulterer. And God put that forth in the law to teach us about our soul. Our soul is feminine in nature. The Bible declares that. And the man that it's married to is the old man. And he's not good. He's Nabal. He's wicked. He's evil. He's churlish. He's foolish. He hates God. He hates David. And um, But when he died, Abigail is now free to marry another. Just like Paul said... In Romans 7, what, now that the man is dead, she is now free to marry another. And in that context, now that she has been relieved of the bondage to Nabal, her flesh, body, she now is available to be married to Jesus. And Jesus marries a woman. Haters just going to hate. Amen? Amen. Uh, and so that's what the Bible said. That's what Romans seven twenty two. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So my joy is not always outwardly apparent. It's not always apparent on the outside. You may see me on days where I'm not very joyful. But my inward man is. And maybe... Maybe it's not going to make the outer man happy. I don't expect much out of the outer man. But the inward man is everything to me. That's what I want to hang on to. That's what I want to be is that inward man. Because John said that the inward man does not sin. The new man, because it was born of God. He that, he, he that is born of God sinneth not. Now look at Romans, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 4.16. I like this. For which cause we faint not, 
but though our outward man perish, we're getting older, John. Okay? And I, it may be a, a point of jealousy and contention between me and you that you display more gray hair than I do. For a while. For a while. What, until mine falls out or what? <laughs> but anyway, boy, it's getting really thin up here. Um, my outward man is perishing. My inward man is renewed day by day. Oh, I love that. Um, you've heard me quote this verse. Turn to Lamentations. Um, let's see here. Yeah, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. God's faithfulness to us is that he renews the inward man. He says here in 2 Corinthians, day by day, he says here that his mercies and his uh, love and his compassion for us is new every morning. So while... Uh, Bless his heart. One of, my, one of my grandchildren came to me after service this morning and apologized for something they did during church. And that blessed me. Okay? And I, I love that. I, and I enjoy it when I can see in my grandchildren God working in them. I love it. Um, it's like, Alicia, I get a chance to raise kids all over again and not make the mistakes I made the first time. So what I'm going to do is make new mistakes with these. Yeah, I'm going to do it all different. But anyway, you get the point. We faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Praise the Lord for that. And, and God is fake. God is the one doing it, not us. And um, let's see here. I'm not sure if that applies there. But anyway, you get the idea here. All right. So now back in Ephesians chapter three. Now that we uh, are able to comprehend. Uh, well, we 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 are grant being granted the riches of his glory. And that comes in the fact that he strengthens us with might by his spirit in the inner man. And here's what I'm going to say uh, to people who. They get afraid when they think about things that, are, that they think are going to go bad in this country or in this world. They get afraid when they think of all the things that God is going to do at the appearing of Christ. God's wrath being poured out. These judgments that we see in the opening of the seals and the blowing of the trumpets. People get very, very fearful. And I've had to... Um, Try to help people understand that so what if things go bad? Their biggest fear is, is that they're going to be put to a test to see whether or not they really are saved and really serve God. And they think they're going to fail the test because they're not sure that they want to deal with or face hard things or persecution or even death and not so much by the death of their self having to face the death of the people that they love and they get afraid at end times teaching prophecy teaching they say i, don't, I just don't want to think about that right now they get afraid when uh they read something on the internet about some new medicine or some new vaccine or some new this or some new that they get they get worried about that they, they have been told that if they are, are part of anything like that, that they're going to lose their salvation, that God's going to send them to hell for that, and so on and so on. And I'm here to tell you that, number one, if you're not saved, you need to be saved so that you will be saved in the day of saving. I don't know how many times I can say it. 
But you, you need to be. And that's why you're afraid. And that's why you believe half that junk you see on the internet is because somebody, somebody and I know who it was, blasting, I don't know if it was targeted toward my wife, but they were blasting people, women, who go get a mammogram. Because it's almost like they were saying they deserve to get cancer from that. I know what my wife and I went through. If it wasn't for that mammogram, finding that little dot, she'd be dead today. And I, people just, they are fear mongers. And you need to stay away from people like that. They're not going to do you any good. They're going to fill you with so much fear, you are going to freak out. So what you have to understand is that if you're really saved, God is automatically, verse 16, is going to strengthen you with the spirit in the inner man. He is. And you don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to fail the test. God's going to make sure that you pass. If you really are saved, he's going to make sure you pass it. He's not going to let any of those things happen to you to steal your soul and for you to lose your salvation. He's not going to do that. That's not the God I serve. Amen? And I'm not sure I would serve a God like that. I, I, I need a lot of assurances, and the only place I get them for good is from the Word of God. And I'm glad for those. I had a bless her heart. I had a young lady come up to me uh, yesterday. Uh, I taught on UFOs in the morning and then on Catholicism in the afternoon. She came up to me, I think after my talk on UFOs, and she said that she had had experiences in her life. She mentioned she had a bad childhood. She didn't say what it was about, but, you know, a lot of times you can guess. And um, she said that because of the things she went through, she deals with a lot of fear, and she, um, she, she said that she is possessed by a, a devil, and, and I was going to just jump right in and correct her, but God didn't let me because I really I understood what she was saying that she's just she's she's pounded on by a by a spirit and she may not understand what she's saying when she talks about being possessed by one but I believe that she meant that she was hounded by one and you know th these things were after her all the time and she said you know she mentioned something about UFOs I didn't quite catch it but she said can you recommend something for me to go to in the Bible. I said, God, I uh, need a little help here. And finally, it just it clicked. I'm going, read Psalms. And she said, God has me doing that already. I said, there you go. There's your witness right there. I said, read it. Because you're going to see over and over, you're going to see David say it, I cried unto the Lord. I cried, I called unto, I, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. You're going to see that over and over in the book of Psalm. And then I said, then add Proverbs to it. She went, oh, I just started on that too. What do you need me for? I, my job is done. I'm out of here. But bless her heart. She was, I mean, she was serious. She was going, she had a rough life. Young lady. Probably not 20, 22 years old, something like that. And um, so God, I can see God moving in her life and in her heart. And that, that blessed me, it really did. So her outer man's perishing, her inward man is being strengthened every day. And she's, she's learning how to fight these spirits. Learning how to deal with them in their presence and what it takes for, you know, when God drives them away and so on. Now look at verse 17. Ephesians 3, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Um, there it is. There's the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, and depth, and height. Now verse 19 and 20. 19 says, and to know the love of Christ. Then it says, it's not knowable. Almost. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. How do you reconcile that? 
I know the love of Christ. I have the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. I know that sometimes I fail to really comprehend why. What is it about me that God loves so much? Because God knows I don't love me that much. But I know God does. And it's like I was saying this morning there in Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy 7, where God was, you know, Moses was telling Israel, God was telling them, don't think that I'm bringing you into this land because you're the greatest nation. You're greater in number than anybody. I'm bringing you into this land because their wickedness. I'm going to drive them out and I'm going to put you in their place. And if you ask why I'm doing that, because I set my love upon you. And a guy said something to me years ago, and it, I'm, it's sad to say that he meant this in a very wicked, vile way. He basically meant it in a homosexual way. But he said these words, Mike, you can't help who you love. Now, I know the guy. I know why he was saying that. But when I take that phrase... What I read here, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. God sets his love upon people. Number one, his love for mankind in general is displayed in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I read a Calvinist argument on John 3, 16. Calvinists don't believe that anybody can choose Christ. Christ chooses you and that's all there is to it. And the Calvinist argument, they took... Uh, that verse and they put it into the original Greek and shredded it all to pieces and made it basically come back out and say for God only so loves I don't remember how he put it but he made it sound like God only loves the saints and that's why he gave his only begotten son that whosoever of the saints believed in him should not perish but have eternal life I'm like, you just destroyed the verse. It was fine the way it was. For God so loved the world. Everybody in the world. Red, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in His sight. Evil, wicked, depraved, debauched, undeserving. God loves them still. Christ died for them. And they have just as much right to hear the gospel as anybody else does. Uh, you ask me why I go to a UFO convention every year now. I go because I see the faces of people there. You know, yesterday that up in Ohio, Iowa, I was well received by those people. I mean, God just gave me grace. It was fun. That's not how it is at MUFON. Some of those people end up hating me. I, I won't be surprised if I apply one year to go up there and do what we're doing and I get turned down. Because I'm sure my name is being bandied about because one of the persons that I'm speaking out against has a position in that organization. So I figured at some point they'll say, don't, don't let him come back. Make up whatever you got to make up. So anyway, I, it may happen, but those people are just as much deserving of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ as anybody else in this world, no matter how strange their beliefs are. Amen to that. So, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. God loves us and he loves us. And that love is what compels him. It's what drives him. It's why he does what he does. God is love. Amen. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Boy, that's a big thing. Now, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly or exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I love that verse. And I'll tell you why. Um, for me, studying sorcery, wizardry, witchcraft, uh, occult practices and trying to understand them uh, has just been a matter of number one curiosity 
But number two, I can see clearly now how God is using the things that I've learned in understanding some things that are going on all around us, literally all around us, okay? I mentioned yesterday that every priest in the, every Catholic church is practicing wizardry when they say the, the phrase, this is my body, and they're holding up that wafer, that cracker, that wheat cracker, a wheat thin, and saying, this is Christ. Uh, Hawk, let's see. In, let's see. Hawk, may, let's see. Hawk est corpus meum. I got it. Does that sound familiar, Chris? Hawk est corpus meum. It's where the phrase hocus pocus came from. People were making fun of the priest who was saying these magic words to turn this wafer into the meat and blood of Jesus Christ. Literally a piece of his body. And they're going to eat it. That's sick. But they were, they were mocking the priests who were using these magic words, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, and they kind of perverted it to hocus pocus. And so anybody saying a, a phrase, a magic phrase, a pre-written phrase, or whatever, um, they, you have to be careful because they could be very well practicing witchcraft. When we go to... Um, uh, somebody help me out here. I could look it up, but I'm going to make you look it up. Give me one place where the Lord's Prayer is found. Can anybody find that? Huh? Luke 11. You know, I was thinking that very same thing. Now, when, <laughs> when Jesus uh, gave us that, uh, let's see here. What verse, Johnny? Oh, okay, and, he's, they, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from uh, evil. Uh, let's look at... Uh, Hallowed. Where would that be? One of the other gospel writers, because I know they put the, the end ending on it. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Yeah, but I found it before you did. After this manner, after this manner, therefore pray ye. Now that tells us that we can pray what we want to pray or how we want to pray it but the model and the, uh, the idea of it is given to us. Number one, when you pray, regard who God is. Our Heavenly Father. Hallowed be your name. You're not going to hear me going around taking God's name in vain. Okay, that's, it's in me. It's in me, but I, I just don't do it. So, our Father which art in heaven, he says... After this manner, therefore pray ye. The Catholic priest, the Vatican, has turned this into, you must say these words and name for me a prayer that a Catholic priest prays that's not already written out for him to pray. In the Catholic Mass, every Prayer is clearly written out. The Vatican over 2,000 years has written out exactly what every priest is supposed to say. And they believe that by saying these magic words, then it will purify the priest, it will sanctify the congregation, that when they eat the wafer that they've turned into the, the meat tissue of Jesus' body and blood, and when they eat that, even though it still tastes like a wheat thin, they are told, don't regard how it feels in your mouth or what it tastes like. Think only what we tell you to think. That is the body of Jesus Christ. And so they swallow that and they're told now 
that when they go out of the church and they have God in them, they have Jesus in them, that that will help them to conquer sin in their life and they won't sin. Does that work? No. Never worked on it. It doesn't work for the priest. So anyway, um, learning what witchcraft is and why it works and how, it's, how it works has been very, very beneficial to me to understanding people such as Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, uh, Creflo Dollar, um, uh, who, who else? Uh, um, give me some names of some wacko. Benny Hindu, Catherine, uh, what's her name? White? Paula White, yeah. Uh, Beth Moore, she's a Southern Baptist. But all of these people, Joel Osteen, you will not hear him say anything. That, and even in an interview with like Larry King or Oprah, when challenged on this issue of homosexuals, he won't hardly answer the question because he doesn't want to say anything negative. And the reason why he doesn't want to say anything negative is that he honestly believes that if he speaks negative things to a homosexual, they will become what he spoke to them. He, but it's called name it, claim it or whatever. Word faith. But it's also in witchcraft, every witch knows what this is. Then when they see it, they just go, he's practicing witchcraft. Joyce Meyer's doing it as well. And she's got the look to go with it. But basically, it's called the law of attraction. And it goes like this. The universe is full of power and goodness. And the universe, the entirety of the universe, is sort of like a living, conscious entity. And the universe wants to give you good things. But sometimes it gives you bad things. And when you ask why, it is because you attracted bad things to your life by the things that you said. And this is, I am not joking on this. They will say, People like Joyce Myers and Joel Osteen and all that crowd, they will say, be careful when you say, man, that about killed me. Don't say those words. You have just spoken death to yourself. You need to speak life to yourself and speak positive things. Now, the witchcraft, the witches will say that it's the universe that is hearing their words and is returning to them according to the positivity or the negativity that they spoke. So uh, if, if you say, man, I feel sick today. According to the law of attraction, I just spoke negativity to myself and the universe now will give me sickness and I won't feel good. But I already don't feel good. So if you ask me, how do you feel, Pastor Mike? Well, I don't know what to say now. Because if I say I feel great, I'm lying. If I say I feel bad, I just attracted bad to me. That is witchcraft, the law of attraction. So Joel Osteen teaches that. And I was mentioning this morning about this ad I've, I saw. If I find it, I'll play it for you. But it was promoting Joel Osteen's teachings. And this, they kept repeating this. It's all positive. There's nothing negative here. It's all just positive things. So I don't know how many people fit in that basketball court that he uses for a church. Probably some 35, 40,000 people. But it, he's got the place packed every Sunday. Thou, tens of thousands of people sitting there applauding this man who refuses to mention even one sin will not mention hell, won't say the word. And he gives you only the good things that God has to say, but he doesn't warn you of God's judgment because he honestly believes that by saying that, 
He is bringing down judgment upon your life. That's witchcraft. It's called the law of attraction. He practices it. Joyce practices it. All of these big names, they practice this doctrine, this idea, and they encourage hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. First time I went to Kenya, we went in a Christian bookstore in Nairobi looking for Bibles in Swahili that were right. We couldn't find any. And I'm looking at all these books by all these word faith people from America. Joel Osteen was there. Joyce Myers was there. All of that stuff was being sold to those people over there. And I'm going, take a look around you. It's not working. You live in Kibera, the second largest slum in the world. You live there and Joyce told you it's your fault because you spoke negativity and you had negative thinking. One guy recently said that um, if you go to the store, let's say you've got to buy a new toaster. You go in there and you look at the prices and you buy the cheapest piece of junk toaster that Walmart has on the shelf. That's your problem right there. You have um, poverty thinking. Go in there, buy the most expensive toaster that you don't need in the whole store. Buy it even when you don't have the money and you know it because now you're thinking prosperity thinking. Witchcraft. And when you purchase that, they say God, the witches say the universe, but they're talking about the same thing. It will return prosperity to you. Um, I'm going to play, hopefully I'll do it this week. Peter Popoff. I've recorded some of his commercials. They play during Perry Mason, which I watch every night. Okay. But any, I like law stuff. All right. I like stuff from the 50s. So anyway. Because I wasn't born then. But anyway, so Peter Popoff has these commercials. And what he's doing, since he got caught on the Johnny Carson show, uh, a magician by the name of James Randi appeared on Johnny Carson. And, um, and this magician sent in a guy to go attend a Peter Popoff thing somewhere in some city. And he went in there and he had this radio receiver that would scan radio frequencies and he goes in there with it and he picks up the frequency that Peter Popoff's wife is sitting in the back room of this huge auditorium and she's reading the prayer cards that everybody filled out before they went in everybody filled out a prayer card name address phone number and what ailment they had and so his wife would select these prayer cards she would read into a microphone. It was transmitted. He had an earpiece in his ear. James Randi's guy picked up the, the frequency and recorded what she said. And she said, PD, I hope you're listening because if not, you're going to be in trouble. She's telling him that. And then she starts reading the name of somebody. And Peter Papa's going, James, James Hu Hu Hubert, James Hubert from Cincinnati. Uh, you live on, uh, uh, you live on Main Street. God's going to heal that diabetes. And he walks up, guy stands up. He's going, oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God told him that. And he goes over and whacks him on the head. The guy falls down. This is not on the Johnny Carson show. But one of the things that his wife told him during one of his crusades, she said, Petey, uh, and she said this, she said, Petey, you got the wrong person. It's that big black blank woman. She used the N-word. Um, that's the one you're going after. And she said, you better keep your hands off of her chest. I'm watching you. So that didn't make it on The Tonight Show. But he got caught. Got caught faking God. So you think... He's going to go away into oblivion. Nope. He filed bankruptcy, restarted his ministry, found a church that would have him, basically bought out the church so he has this ministry now underneath him, and he could take in all this money tax-free. And now he specifically targets black communities because, by and large, they tend to be more emotional, and they make decisions, especially American blacks, on more on the 
emotional side than the logic side. And it's mainly women. And he is fleecing them into the tens of millions of dollars every year. Same scam, same modus operandi, same thing. But now his, his thing is, he's got these little ketchup packets that have water in it. And he says, this is miracle spring water. And he gives some verse about the springs from the Bible. And he says that God wants to release prosperity in your life. This miracle spring water will be what releases prosperity into your life. So what do you do? You fall for this thing. You want to be rich. You, you get, you send them your address. They send you the ketchup packet full of water. You do what you're supposed to do with it. Uh, they tell you don't drink it, but you put it on your pillow or you lay it on your wallet or your bills or whatever. And then he's got all these people that they're interviewing to say, I used the miracle spring water and I got a check for $40,000 a month later than that. And you can see who's ever holding the microphone, mouthing the words for them to follow. It's a script. Okay. But the bottom line is he is still teaching them witchcraft. So uh, we'll close with this. Um, back in Ephesians. And knowing this verse um, basically refutes everything that they say. Uh, now unto him, verse 20, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Meaning, we don't know how to pray. We don't know the magic words. But it's okay. The magic words don't really exist. And if you just call unto the Lord, God will hear you. You think God wants to give you bad things? No. Only if to chasten you to teach you a lesson. But other than that, God then turns around and blesses you. That instant almost. And so when it comes time for you to pray, I've had people tell me, Mike, I think you, ought, I think you have to be specific with God. There's no way. There's no way I can't be. I've prayed about issues and I had no clue what was going on. And I spent time in prayer and all of a sudden, boom, God showed me exactly what was going on. That's, that happens. So be free because I spoke it to you. <laughs> be free in Jesus' name with the idea that he is able to do exceeding abundantly more than we ask or think. Amen. Let's stand.